Good afternoon, everyone. It's really good to be here. I was struck by what the physiotherapist said about uh, needing to uh, streamline the, the, the number of uh, bits of information flowing. Uh, when I was a home care organiser many years ago in, in Glasgow, I, I recall a, an elderly service user who was being uh, assessed for services, saying uh, that uh, she, was, she felt like her house was like Socky Hall Street because there was so many different people coming in asking the same questions and gathering the same information. And I was struck how uh, similar that was to what the, the physiotherapist was saying. I think integration will help to uh, avoid that and avoid someone feeling that their house is like Socky Hall Street. Many of you uh, may remember that uh, when I was Minister for Public Health in 2011, we uh, committed then to bringing forward legislation to ensure our system of health and social care focuses on the, the people who need it most. So it is fantastic, I think, to have got to this position. I'm personally very excited about the opportunity this brings because back in the 1990s, when I was uh, operating in the field, we dreamed about this moment of integration. Now, I think we've seen from some of the comments there, it's not going to be all plain sailing. There's still some issues to be overcome, but the opportunity is there um, and an opportunity that we absolutely need to, to grasp with both hands. We've come a long way since 2011. Years of hard work have seen us consult and legislate and work together across the NHS, local government, the third and independent sectors, government and parliament, all coming together to change the way that we work and improve the outcomes that we achieve. And I'm very grateful to everyone who has been involved. It's been a lot of hard work. COSLA and local government more broadly, the NHS and colleagues in the third and independent sectors have all come out of perhaps their comfort zones to help to make this happen. But I want to step away from some of that detail, some of that discussion and the process for a moment, because I want to focus on what integration is all about. We've been doing a lot of work in recent years to put a human face on data for health and social care so that local systems can plan to support people who have multimorbidities in a better way. My officials shared some recent findings from that work with me. And we've established that in any year, 2% of the population account for 50% of hospital and prescribing resource use. And that's remarkable enough. But even more striking is that the same 2% of the population account for three quarters of unscheduled bed days in Scotland. That's astonishing. That's just over 100,000 people using three quarters of all unscheduled bed days in Scotland. Now, I suppose to any of us think that the, that statistic should suggest that people are getting the right care at the right time in the right place. It might be appropriate that a very small people, number of people account for a very large proportion of resource use. But it certainly made me question. I suppose we have to think about, really, is it appropriate that they account for so much unplanned reactive hospital care? If our localities and partnerships can understand the pathways of care experienced by this 2% of the population, then surely they would be better placed to redesign the pathways to proactively plan their care. And this, for me, is evidence that we have much more to do to improve preventive and anticipatory care. The data I just referred to is available to all of you in your areas. You all have access to it through Information Services Division, and every partnership also has access to bespoke analytical support from ISD. I believe that every partnership must use this data and this support to improve our focus around Scotland on preventive care and to shift the balance of care into communities. And we're not starting with a blank page, but we do need to push on. We need to accelerate improvement and build on the foundation that we've created. I've been impressed by some of the examples of integration that I've seen while I've been out and about. Clark Manager Community Healthcare Centre provides a wide range of services to its local community. The centre is home to two inpatient wards, three GP practices, a day therapy unit and a local mental health resource centre. Wester Hales Healthy Living Centre developed in partnership with NHS Lothian, the City of Edinburgh Council and the local community 
provides a range of health, social care and family support services, really tackling health inequalities in the area. In Argyll and Butte, GPs are working in community hospitals to reduce unnecessary admission to hospital. And these are some of the examples of what integration is about, bringing together services and people to ensure an integrated, holistic, person-centred experience. And I want and expect more initiatives like these to develop across Scotland. Of course, one size doesn't fit all. There will be different models for different circumstances. But what's important is that we improve the whole system, the whole pathway of care and the well-being of the whole person. It's about health and social care. And more than that, it's also about making sure that we make the best use of services that can greatly improve the person's standard of living, such as their housing provision. So here we are on the threshold of the, the biggest change to the way we deliver health and social care services in Scotland, probably since 1948. This week, the first of our new integrated partnerships for health and social care will go live. All around Scotland, chief officers have been appointed to lead the work of the new partnerships, and many of you will have been closely involved in writing your integrated schemes. And I appreciate that a lot of work goes into writing the schemes in each area. Each one is unique to the circumstances of the partnership. Each one depends on strong joint working between the Health Board and the Council. And it's been great to see these core documents arriving for sign-off. So well done, particularly to the three Ayrshire partnerships for getting their schemes across the line first. There's only a fleeting moment of success, though. Once the schemes are, are signed off, the local work to improve outcomes really begins as partnerships get to work on their strategic plans for integrated services. We're already seeing examples of improvement through integration, such as Glasgow's ambitious programme to discharge people home to assess uh, within uh, 20, 72 hours and to develop intermediate care to support these ideals and I think that is a really important change because although we were absolutely the people who set the, the targets for delayed, delayed discharge initially four weeks and of course uh, two weeks from the 1st of April, um, I think it's fair to say that human nature being human nature quite often works to the target and uh, if you set a four week target then people work to three weeks, five days, six days and so on. With 72 hours being the discharge standard, it immediately makes people think about discharge as soon as the person is admitted. It just turns on its head the thought process. And I think that is really important. I want every partnership to be bold and ambitious. And when someone is being charged, I want everyone involved to ask the simple question, why not home? Why not home for assessment? Why not home to live? And if they can't go home, then they should be offered a period of step-down intermediate care and then ask the question again, why not home? Only if someone is unable to return home should we look at other solutions for long-term care. Achieving our goals will be a challenge, I've no doubt about that, and innovation will be crucial to success in terms of improving outcomes and what happens in communities within partnerships in primary and social care settings will be just as important, if not more important than what happens in hospitals. And that's why we've legislated for localities within partnerships. And I can't overstate the importance of engaging clinicians in particular localities and also communities in the wider team of professionals. Localities' priorities must drive strategic planning in partnerships to enable a real shift towards supporting people in their own homes. In future, that should mean providing more care in communities and making less use of expensive hospital care when that's not in the best interest of the person receiving care. And of course, improving care is not a task only for the statutory partners. Many of you here may be from the third and independent sectors, and that is vitally important too, which is why, of course, we've assured their role in the legislation. At the weekend, we had a party conference and uh, one of the fringe meetings I spoke at was hosted by the Alliance. And hearing about some of the real innovative practice around preventive and anticipated care was really remarkable. So much uh, innovation, but sometimes small scale. And I think, again, there's, there's more of that, that that we can do and absolutely fundamental to underpinning integration. As part of ensuring 
a real improvement in the quality of services, we in central government ha have our role to play too. We recognise that some additional resource to assist and support innovation is required. We are already providing £100 million in 1516 to support innovative integrated practice and partnerships under the Integrated Care Fund. I previously announced the extension of the fund for two further years, £100 million per year in 1617 and 17-18. That £200 million is part of more than half a billion pounds of additional funding that we are providing over the next three years to support integration. And I expect this investment to be used to support and drive innovation in local systems. The money must be used to build up preventive and anticipated care, to drive down delayed discharge, to extend our use of telehealth and to support primary care in its key role in leading integration. So how will we know whether integration is working? You all know that the integrator indicators to support integration are now published and they reflect two important aspects of care. Firstly, people's experience of care, which is critically important, such as the percentage of adults who are able to look after their own health well. And secondly, key measures of the effect effectiveness of the system, such as the rate of emergency admissions to hospital for adults and the percentage of people who are discharged from hospital within 72 hours of being ready. These indicators will help us to understand progress across Scotland towards our core priorities. Tackling delayed discharges and managing unscheduled care remain among my highest priorities. We allocated significant additional funding at the end of last year to reduce delayed discharge. But the impact of our overall investments in delayed discharge will take some time to be felt, but I was pleased to see that we avoided the usual winter surge. The January census showed that 20 local authorities had delays over two weeks in single figures and are well placed, therefore, to deliver the zero target in April. But, of course, I expect all partnerships to achieve this next month. But I want to go further than that and to eradicate this problem entirely from our system. One patient delayed is one too many. Remaining unnecessarily in hospital is a poor outcome for the individual concerned, and that's what we all have to keep in the forefront of our minds. Far, for far too many people, we're providing the worst possible outcome at the highest possible cost. Clinical evidence does show us that any delay over 72 hours is detrimental to well-being. People lose their cognitive skills, the independent skills that they've lived with for many years. And that's why 72 hours must in the future be the measure of success and why routinely discharging patients within that timescale must be our shared ambition. At the January census, 14 local authorities um, recorded fewer than 10 delays of more than 72 hours, showing it can be done, and that, I think, is real progress. Two priorities are key to the implementation of integration. The first of which I've spoken at length is improving outcomes for people using services. The second, without which the first cannot succeed, is to support the workforce into and through implementation. Your agenda today has followed the same pattern, with your focus this morning on improving people's lives via integration and this afternoon, your role as leaders of the workforce. Our ambitions for health and social care integration are clearly set out. Wherever you live and whatever your circumstances, we are committed to ensuring this country is the best place to live healthy, fulfilling and independent lives. I'm confident that by working together across sectors and disciplines and within communities, we will succeed. But we need you as leaders in your field to help us do that. It's not something government can do alone. So I want to conclude by showing a six-minute film. The film is the story of Barry and his mother, Alison. Barry is 37 years old and has spastic quadriplegia, epilepsy and a profound learning disability and lives in shared accommodation. Barry is unable to speak, but Alison is his legal and welfare guardian and has significant experience of managing his transition between hospital and social care. I think Barry's story is an enlightening reminder about the importance of sharing information between health and social care services and speaking directly to the person and or their carer. So here's the film. Barry's 37. He lives in a purpose-built uh, house uh, with three other residents 
and they have a 24 hour care. Barry has got spastic quadriplegia, he has learning difficulties, but he also is epileptic, so he does take seizures quite often. If any seizure lasts more than a couple of minutes, then he has to go to hospital. The negatives in relation to that is that he doesn't know where he's going, he doesn't know why he's going. Uh, when he gets there, he doesn't know who the people are. That, uh, that are looking after them and which is the reason why I go because through, you know Barry's, Barry's 37 and I'm the one continuous person in his life. He's had lots of people caring for him over the years, he's even had different doctors over the years but I've always been there so mm. I'm security for him uh, and particularly if he if Barry, one of the things, that, and this is particularly in relation to Barry, is that if he doesn't see me for any length of time, he becomes depressed. Uh, and that's actually, you know, visible. That his skin breaks down and, you know, uh, so that's why it is important that, that, that I'm there. But that's, you know, the negativity in relation to him being in the hospital is the equipment. They're, they're just no prepared. Even though the noise coming in, the, you've seen a consultant before he's went in, they know mm. that he's got profound disabilities uh, and you go into the ward and the nursing staff are, oh my goodness, what do we do? <laughs> we've no got this, we've no got that. Uh, I actually tend to take, because he's, in, he's doubly incontinent, so I'll take pads in with me because they'll, have, they'll be different ones that he'll have. Uh, they, they don't have bumpers for the bed which he needs mm. because uh, because he's shape the leg will come out the side uh, and he could break his ankle do you know so they don't have these special mm. feeding cups special spoons he, like he has a spoon and it has to be coated because as you'll, you you could probably hear is that he grinds his teeth so that's why you have to have the coated spoon the, the positive side that I've experienced is that the, when you speak to a consultant, they're, they're very welcoming of me as his mother going in and spending the time with him. They will, if he's in a room of his own, they will give me a kind of coat thing to, to lie on. Or if they can, if he's in a main ward, they'll allow me to stay and come in at nine o'clock in the morning and leave at nine o'clock at night. The support that we've had from health and social care have been different. Uh, in, terms, in terms of the health, that's generally been relatively good. Uh, you know, the odd uh, bit that's not so helpful. But in terms of uh, social care, that's been, that's been from terrible to okay. You know, and I think the I think the difference is that the people on the ground level that uh, provide the, the day to day care for Barry, uh, they are well meant, mm. their hearts in the right place, they want to do their best, but they don't have the training to uh, to you know allow them to provide the best for Barry. Alison. Um works on community council in Drum Chapel and we know that she has um, a son with disabilities. What we find with the people in Drum Chapel and surrounding areas, carers or people in a caring role, sometimes when the person that they're caring for goes into respite, they're so tired of the 24-hour care that they're giving others they forget about the care for themselves. COPE has in Drum Chapel three full-time paid staff here. We have about eight associates who are self-employed with COPE. The rest of our staff are volunteers. We rely a lot on our volunteers from setting up the relaxation rooms for the clients coming in and they can speak to the clients because sometimes clients think, oh, I'm not going in that door, what am I going to say? And the, the volunteers are the first people that the clients see when they come through the door and they make them a feel at ease, making a cup of tea. A cup of tea works a long way than a, a painkiller does. Well, I hope the integration between the two services is a way to the future.
And as I say before, people like Alison, they know that they can go to one organisation. The support there is from all angles. She's not going to get fobbed off. She's not going to tick a box, then say, oh, go through to the next door. We don't have four doors and you make a pick out of which one. Our doors are open. Each and every one of our four doors are open, no matter what your problem is. This whole process of health and social care integration means that there'll be new ways of thinking. Cultures will clash and we need to build some safe spaces where dialogue can take place. And within the Alliance, the Health and Social Care Academy is a forum that we have created to enable discussion and dialogue about new ways of working, about new services to be designed, about new approaches to involving people with lived experience. And that will be crucial as we build a new platform for public service reform in this area uh, in the years ahead. Okay, uh, well, the Alliance certainly get everywhere, don't they? <laughs> uh, I think it just shows that through uh, Barry and Alison's story that a bit of a mixed bag of experience there and importantly some reflections on the, the third sector um, and their reflections on what more can be done to support people like Barry uh, and indeed Alison as, as his carer. So enough from me. I think there's a time for uh, a couple of questions if you'd like. So um, fire ahead. Thank you. Right, while you're having a think, I will have a kick up well, with one myself. You said a bit about things that you'd seen yourself locally, um, both in Clip Manager and in mm -hmm. uh, Wester Hales, that looked like a vision of, of a good future. I wonder if you could pick out a couple of things that you think made the difference there. So what was it that, that made, made it good? Okay, well, the GPs that I spoke to in Wester Hales, um, they, were, they happened to be salaried GPs, but, but leaving that aside, they were saying that the way we organise primary care at the moment um, isn't always conducive to putting the resources where they need to go to tackle health inequalities. They needed a, a far more flexible way of working within uh, that health centre. And I mean, everybody was in that centre, from social work to uh, home care, uh, criminal justice, and all the health professionals as well. It was absolutely everybody under one roof. But at the focus, it was about tackling health inequalities and engaging with the local community. So, for example, the GPs had spent some time setting up a, a buggy walking group, which was young mums who were socially isolated, uh, not very fit, were maybe actually spending time with the wrong folk and um, were depressed uh, and so on and so forth. And they got those young mums together. Now, that would not normally be something that a GP would get involved in, but they felt it was really, really important because it was better to do that than to start prescribing antidepressants, mm -hmm. uh, which they've managed, incidentally, to cut down a lot of the prescribing of. So one example, um, but nevertheless, um, they were keen to do more of that, but it required a more flexible way of delivering primary care. And I think that's something for us to take back around the, the new contract as it begins to be negotiated. Um, Clip Manager, the, the integrated team that's already integrated, uh, that's like a rapid response team, uh, works really, really well. So they're 2% of the population that I was describing earlier on. They get a special phone number that isn't NHS 24, but it's a special phone number to that team. And if any one of those uh, people have a fall or need help, the rapid response team goes out. And actually, very, very few of them ended up going into hospital, whereas before that team were established, uh, that, that group of, of people living within that area were regularly in and out of Larbert Hospital. So um, I guess that is their solution to the 2%, mm -hmm. but there will be different solutions to supporting that 2% of the population across Scotland with uh, comorbidities and many things, many challenges, but it, but it works. And if it can work in Clip Manager uh, along that model, then I'm sure something similar would, would work elsewhere as well. Thanks very much. Anyone else like to pitch in a question before we move on? Yes, Ronald, this table here. Good afternoon, Cabinet Secretary. Um, I wonder whether you would say a little more about the importance of encouraging careers in care. Mm -hmm. uh, this afternoon's sessions around workforce. We're going to need more people to fulfil these roles. In parts of the country, we have difficulty recruiting nurses to work in care recruit social care workers to work in care. And it's not always all about the financial side of it, that may be part of it, but just actually how we make 
working in care. You've referred to your own professional background. Uh, uh, and, but how are we going to face that challenge going forward? And is there a collective responsibility within integration to promote uh, careers in care uh, going forward? Yes, um, well we need to because if we don't we're going to have a, a real challenge and uh, I think partly it's about the, the perception of care and working in the care sector. We need to change that and we need to value it more and it needs to be seen as a, a career that has opportunities. Now part of that is, is about paying conditions and obviously we've um, been having some uh, very uh, ongoing fruitful discussions with yourselves and with COSLA around how we can play our part to um, improve some of, of, of those aspects but it's not just about paying conditions it's also about career progression and I think the NHS has a, a there's a huge opportunity for through integration for the, the boundaries between care and NHS to to be less defined that people potentially could move out, in and out of careers within um, the care sector and the NHS and that we could develop career uh, opportunities, training, qualifications that enable people uh, to do that. So that if you know, for example, if you come in as a, a, a basic grade carer in whatever sector, that if you want to, you can gain training and qualifications that can open up doors to qualified posts either within the care sector or the NHS. And there's a lot of discussions going on around how practically to make that happen. I think also uh, young people in terms of modern apprenticeships and opportunities for school leavers to go in to uh, care, the care sector or indeed the NHS, uh, we, can, we can get better at that. But I think there's definitely something in better career progression and opportunities, but also importantly, the, the paying conditions, which is something that, uh, as I say, we continue uh, to discuss. In order to, if someone came up with a statistic, I don't know if it's true, but you know, if we, if we continue the way we are and we don't reorganise uh, care and we don't uh, uh, get into a more sustainable position, it was something like, you know, that effectively, all of us will have to end up working in the, the care sector to, to keep the show on the road, or every young person leaving school will have to go, because the, the requirements for the care sector, the growth requirements over the next few years, uh, are going to be significant. Now, that all opens up significant career opportunities for people, but it has to, we have to make it a more attractive proposition. We have a role in government to do that, but we need to work uh, with yourselves across the different sectors to change the perception uh, of working in care and to, to make it more attractive by putting more attractive propositions around it. Thank you.